always image conscious, it is now that Peter Moore brands himself as the man in black. Wherever he goes, locals can spot him. He positively craves the attention. He had a black shirt, black tie, black trousers. I mean, that was his colour. Despite, let's say, being slightly effeminate, I mean, anybody who wears all black clothing at night can seem quite intimidating, I imagine. Um, and he seemed to revel in this man in black uh, image. Moore's sexuality is still a secret known only to a few. Ironically, hugely trusted by the general community of North Wales, friends like cinema owner Lewis are beginning to suspect Peter has a violent streak. I used to put a thing above the door on a Sunday night, most programmes. I used to say, pay to get in, pray to get out. I used to love that saying. I think that sums him up pretty much. At this stage, the Welsh police had not linked the death of Henry Roberts to violent and sexual attacks on a string of men dating back a decade, and they don't release information about the sexual motive in the murder of Roberts. Quite clearly, there are some clues in relation to the type of perpetrator that the police might have been dealing with, but for whatever reasons, evidence in relation to Roberts' lifestyle as a gay man was never at that stage released to the public which meant there was simply no knowledge within the area where Peter Moore lived of a man motivated to attack other men for sexual pleasure. So Moore was free to target more victims. He knows where to look. The public toilets in Pentarden was a well-known haunt, a cottage, as it's called, for homosexual activities. Peter Moore knew the types of places that gay men would congregate and he would go to those places to seek his sexual thrills. This is part of the subculture of gay men in the North Wales community. Clearly, as a gay man himself, Peter Moore understood that subculture. He was able to gain access to these gay men. He had been going down to the beach in Pensarn for many, many years. And I think that's the kind of activity that gays were probably restricted to uh, in the area for so long. Both at the beach and randomly picking up men whilst cruising nearby, Moore carries out frenzied attacks. Some are reported to the police, but many are not. A lot of the attacks were on gay people who would have been reluctant to report. But there were two or three extremely uh, serious attacks, and I think it was fortunate that the victims survived. Still, nobody suspects Peter Moore. He meets a 28-year-old man at a gay bar in nearby Liverpool, about an hour's drive from North Wales. He catches the eye of a young man. He was approached by Edward Carthy. Edward had been quite drunk and had approached him, and obviously um, so. Peter as a, as a potential partner and asked him if he was interested in, in spending the night with him. Moore agrees and begins to give Edward Carthy a lift home. Edward is in grave peril as he falls asleep in the back of Peter's van. He takes Edward Carthy into a forest and the stab wounds on Edward Carthy are not in places which would have killed Edward immediately. They weren't stab wounds to the heart, for example, or to the head. They were stab wounds to the buttocks, to the thighs, to the stomach area. Places that would clearly hurt Edward, but weren't places that were actually going to kill him immediately. Edward Carthy eventually becomes Peter Moore's second murder victim. He's buried in an isolated forest where his body will lay undiscovered for months. But why was Moore targeting at random men who he would then kill incredibly violently? Could the letters written to reporter Gareth Hughes give any clue? We've got this very high episode with the sharpness and the aggression. It's all this aggression that's been pent up deep inside. Somebody's got to pay for it. I think it was punishing other people for his father because if his father treated him coldly and aggressively, and this, this, obviously in this writing that's the case, men have to pay. 
Always careful to keep up the facade, Peter continues to work at his picture houses, giving him the perfect cover. He is the hard-working businessman, the saviour of Welsh cinemas. But by the late 90s, Moore's cinemas are struggling as distributors prefer to send new films to the big modern multiplexes. Moore desperately tries to bring in revenue. He sold everything from key rings to banners to caps. It was, it was, it was more like a market store. He converts one cinema into a pool hall. Anything to keep his local entertainment business afloat and his image intact. He had these dreadful pool tables which were levelled up with a brick under each leg because it was the floor was on the slant. When later trying to understand Moore's motives, detectives begin to suspect his killing spree helps Moore forget his money troubles. By going to kill these people, it gave him some form of uh, relaxation. He was relaxed afterwards and um, he, he described during the course of the murders being in a in a zone and he described having zigzag um, lights around him as, as he was committing the murders. Driving the back roads of North Wales to and from the cinemas he runs, Peter Moore stews on the stress that he's under. Later, he described to police in intricate detail what happened on one grisly evening. He notices a building site where married father and grandfather Keith Randalls works as a watchman. Peter chooses to leave his usual killing comfort zone of the gay community. He knocked on the door, and as Keith came to the door, he, 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 he stabbed him in the stomach in the doorway. We know something of the exchange between Keith Randalls and Peter Moore because subsequently of things that Peter Moore revealed to the police, and Keith Randalls doesn't understand why Peter Moore is trying to kill him. And Peter Moore seemingly says, uh, because he can. Now, it's that shamelessness that reveals so much about Moore's psychology. Because he can. Because he has power. Because he's able to terrorise this victim. Because he wants to be dominant. Keith Randalls, aged 49, becomes the third person to be murdered by Wales's Man in Black. It was a brutal murder. It really was a brutal murder. And I think I literally happened to be in the wrong place uh, at the wrong time. Peter Moore doesn't care about the pain and anguish he's causing. He later tells police that he even combed the papers to revel in his infamy. I think there's a sense of Moore reading these accounts and rather enjoying the fact that the person that everybody's talking about is him. Is It's Peter Moore. I bet you never thought Peter Moore could have done these kinds of things. Between September and November 1995, he has murdered three times, moving the bodies for burial in his vehicle and all the while playing the part of the hard-working local businessman. Moore is completely beyond suspicion. But one day, a girl who works at the video club next to Peter's cinema notices something suspicious. On occasions, I see him washing, cleaning out inside of his van, and I never thought anything of it. I just thought he's cleaning it. But yeah, he was cleaning out his van and washing it out inside. And you just make mental notes, I think. Moore shows Regina, who occasionally cleans the cinema for Peter, a surprising collection of finds that he's made. I was there one night and he said, oh, look what I found, look at all these. And we said, oh, where on earth have you got all them? Because it was wallets and watches. And he said, well, I've, I found them when I was cleaning the cinema. Um, me and my mother laughed and said, you know, in all the years that we've been cleaning the cinema, we've never found one. In reality, Peter Moore is collecting trophies from his victims. How many more will he gather before he's caught? Tony had been stabbed on the beach of Pensar. There were signs that there'd been a struggle, and unfortunately, Tony had been stabbed in the process. Three men have been murdered in a remote part of Wales in as many months. Police only know about two, and are unable to make any connection. Meanwhile, Peter Moore's behaviour at the picture houses is occasionally beginning to lose its veneer. We were watching the film, and this lad ran up one side, ran across in front of the seats, and then the other side, and then Peter 
appeared and ran across the road, like he was chasing him. It was like a, you know, I mean, like as if the bloke was running circles around him. It didn't look good, not in the middle of a film. Richard Blackwell, now working for Peter Moore, becomes alarmed when Peter starts boasting about what he has done. He reveals that he's dealt out a number of beatings to men in North Wales. Richard considers going to the police. I'd asked somebody at church who was to do with the police. I'd asked their advice because it was starting to tell me things that I, I didn't know whether they were true or whether it was making them up. Ultimately, Richard decided against telling detectives. Like others, including a cinema landlord, Peter's extreme behaviour is considered a private matter. I knew he was into dark stuff. I knew he was into all sorts like that. It didn't interest me. It didn't bother me. I wasn't... It just didn't affect me in any way because all he was was a business partner. All I wanted was his rent every week. As for parents at the cinema club, they too do not suspect more, with the killings now making the headlines. My daughter remembers him as being quite kind to the children. She said often groups of children would come in and some children would have money for sweets and others wouldn't. And so that they were all treated fairly, he would, he would give sweets away to the children so that the children would have sweets uh, along with their friends. Moore's continued success at portraying himself so perfectly as a straightforward cinema manager means that when Tony Davis, a married man, drives to Penzon Beach, he's unaware of the danger when he sees Moore. Experts are certain that Peter Moore's motivation was not to kill because his victims were gay. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. One doesn't get a sense of Peter Moore targeting other gay men because he hates gay men. One gets a sense of Peter Moore targeting gay men simply because they're in a subculture that gives him access and opportunity to be able to kill, which is why his fourth victim was somebody whom he could pick up in a cottage, in a place where gay men would go to have sexual encounters. On the evening of October 4th, 1995, Tony Davis leaves his family home, saying he will return after seeing his mother. He was a crematorium worker, a happy family man who lived near Colwyn Bay, and he'd been out to visit his mother that night in Abigail. He didn't return home. He popped out for a short period, and uh, the family were concerned and reported him, and both the police and some of his family were looking for him. During the course of the search, that's when his car was found on, on Pensilhan Beach. And then early the following morning, he was found stabbed on the beach, and people began putting two and two together. The death of Tony Davis offers police a breakthrough. Henry Roberts, Moore's first victim, was known to be gay. Tony Davis's body had been found at a well-known gay haunt. Another victim, security guard Keith Randalls, was not gay but was alone when killed in the same area. For the first time, detectives link the killings. They conclude they're all the work of one man. Any murders uh, are fairly rarely in North Wales, fortunately. Um, for two uh, to be close together uh, is worrying. For three within 50 miles of each other, um, set the alarm bell ringing, I think, if they weren't already by then. The police also get a report of a man seen on Penzon Beach on the night that Tony Davis has gone missing. A man dressed entirely in black. An appeal had been put out for gay men to come forward if they had any information in relation to an individual that had been seen on Penzon Beach dressed in black leather. The appeal to members of the gay community sets in motion a series of events that will result in the capture of Peter Moore. We received some information anonymously via the, the hotline that had been launched that a, a gentleman had been approached by this, this individual who was dressed in black leather on Pensand Beach and taken to a house in Kimmel Bay where he had been attacked uh, and in the words of this individual had been lucky to get away from the, from the house with his life. The anonymous witness is able to give police directions from the beach to a house that David Morris thinks he knows from meetings with a man he simply remembers as the boss of the local cinemas. We followed the directions as they were given. When I saw Darlington House, which was the house that Peter lived in, and I'd seen him on one occasion dressed in black leather. So I went back and re reported to the senior investigating officer that 
I think I'd located the house. As police gather the evidence prior to an arrest, Peter Moore has a private word with his friend Richard Blackwell. Yes, he said, there's been a bad murder. And then he just looked at me with a funny look in his eyes. He said, yes, he said, yeah. it's going to be serious. Wales has known few cases like it. Three men are now known to have been murdered in four months, and the chief suspect is a respected member of the local business community, known to some children as Uncle Peter. Can police prove that the man in black is the serial killer?